So we'll look at a couple examples and well, we'll see about these problems and we'll see what we want to do. Okay, so example 19.5. One gram of water, which is one cubic centimeter, becomes 1,671 cubic centimeters of steam when boiled at constant pressure at one atmosphere. The heat of vaporization for this pressure is L sub V equals 2.256 times 10 to the 6 joules per kilogram. Compute the work done by the water when it vaporizes and B its increase in internal energy. Okay, so part A is just one we can use information we've already learned here. Um, so the first thing is um, if they want us to compute work, we said at the beginning we, we derived this complicated equation for work. And we said, sometimes we can use the simplified version. And the only time we were allowed to use the simplified version was when pressure was constant during the change in volume, because we can pull it out of the integral. So in this problem, is pressure constant? Yeah. Aha, it is, boiled at constant pressure. Great. So part A is really, um, it's, this, it's the basic equation here. Mm, I have to erase something. <clears throat> okay, so that's the equation we decide that we're allowed to use. And then they give us the value of pressure in Pascals. And then the only thing is we've got to do our conversions from cubic centimeters to cubic meters. So I just want to show really quick so we um, make sure we do this correctly. One cubic centimeter. I remember the conversion from one centimeter to a meter. I don't know a conversion from cubic centimeters to cubic meters, but I can figure it out. So I know that there are 100 centimeters in one meter. And if I want to know what the cubic version of that is, I have to cube this whole term. So I'm basically dividing 1 by 100 cubed, which I, don't, I have to calculate that because I don't know it off the top of my head. It's probably like 1 to the negative 6. Oh, I was right. Yeah, so 1 times 10 to the negative 6 cubic meters. There's actually a trick if you look at the zeros. You got two zeros, you got cubed, so you go 2 by 2 by 2, you got 6. Mm, that's pretty clever. I like it. So in, with, with 1671 cubic centimeters, then, then let's see, we do have 1671 <coughs> times 10 to the negative 6. Anyway, you can move the decimals if you want, but that's the hard part about part A, is the conversion. <clears throat> now part B is a little tricky. Um, it says, what is its increase in internal energy? Um, all right, so it's a constant pressure problem. So what kind of process is that? Isobaric. Isobaric. Okay, so my internal energy equation looks complicated. I don't have N. I don't have delta T. Um, do I even know? Oh, I know it's water, so I could figure out CV. But they give us this heat of vaporization L sub V. So that's um, kind of a trick here. So to figure out delta U, in, instead of using the straight up equation they gave us, They've got a backdoor way to figure out delta U. I gotta erase. I'm gonna erase adiabatic because we're gonna we're gonna talk about adiabatic again. Okay, so part part B, delta U and C V delta T is not helpful. 
but we do know that delta U is equal to Q minus W for any process. And the iso, we're, we have an isobaric case, so unfortunately none of those equal zero, but we just calculated work from part A. So that's, that part's not helpful either. So part A, we found out that work was, whatever the book tells us it is, 169 joules. And we can figure out Q um, using stuff we learned last week. So we're going from liquid water to gaseous water, so we've got a state change. So the Q, we can see um, in the solution here, the Q is defined by um, MLV. And the tip-off is that they gave us that latent heat of vaporization term. So making use of that hint, we'll solve this. And they give us, the answer is 2,256 joules. Okay, so, so that's sort of our backdoor way to solve this delta U if we don't know everything in that equation. I'm sorry, but I missed where you got the U equals to 169 joules. Oh, work? Yeah. That was from part A over here if we actually solve pressure times delta V. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. So then plugging in Q and W, 2256 minus 169, they tell us that it's 2,087 joules. This is a really common tactic, so put that in your bag of tricks. If you are looking at a problem and you're like, I don't have enough information, I don't have the numbers to plug in here, consider that this backdoor method we're seeing here as an alternative way to solve these variables. Okay, so yeah. Kilogram, how did we calculate the kilogram in meter? Oh, that it's a mass. kilogram? They tell us it's one gram of water. Okay. So the mass that goes in there um, into this term is one, one gram, which is 0 0.001 kilograms. Okay, what's how they do that? All right, any questions, any more questions on this, this problem? Okay, example 19.7 is um, making use of all those adiabatic equations I just erased. <laughs> um, so they're just, they're, they're just putting you through your paces here. Um, the compression ratio of a diesel engine is 15 to 1, that is the air in the cylinder is compressed to 1 15th of its initial volume. A, if the initial pressure is 1 times 10 to the 5th pascals and initial temperature is 300 Kelvin, find the final pressure and the final temperature after adiabatic compression. So part A, if you are just looking at this table here, and you're looking at, okay, adiabatic, I'm, I'm, a, I'm told one thing, right? I'm told how the volume compresses, and now I'm asked about pressure and temperature. So just these equations alone aren't gonna help us. So we, we have to go back and, and refer to these equations um, in order to solve for um, pressure and temperature. So the first equation, we know how the volume changes and we know the initial pressure, so we can solve for the final pressure. And that's all they're doing. Is that, do they show that step? Oh yeah, okay, they did the temperature first. Yeah. Um, and then they, yeah, they use a second equation to solve for temperature. So it's just algebraically rearranging those equations for P2 and T2. So looking at this, the book solution for part A, do you guys have any questions about how they came up with those equations? Yeah.
No, okay. Part B says, how much work does the gas do during compression if the initial volume of the cylinder is one liter? And then it gives us the values for CV and um, gamma. How much work, okay, so our adiabatic equation for work is minus NCV delta T. We do now have the change in temperature. We don't have N. How did they get that? And CV, let's see, oh, they give us a CV value, and we don't know N. How on earth did they get that? From equation 19.26, when in doubt, check the book. Where'd they get that? That's not something we wrote down. So, okay, okay, so we know work is NCV delta T. So this is kind of some algebraic manipulation that they've done. Nineteen point seven. Okay, so we know the delta T part because they said in uh, part A that T two is eight hundred and eighty six, so starts at three hundred K. Is that 586? So that's our change in temperature. They tell us CV is 20.8 joules per mole times Kelvin. So we still need little n. So we know from the ideal gas law PV equals nRT, that we can rearrange this for n, little n. And our gas is staying contained. We're not losing any gas during the adiabatic process. So this is um, P1, V1 over RT1 is also equal to P2, V2 over RT2. So we could use either of those relationships in order to solve for n. So I don't, I think that's basically where they're going with this. Um, oh, okay, they, the, so they replaced the N and the delta T term, that's what they did. You should be able to get the same answer using this way. So N is, you could do P1 V1 over R T1 times CV times delta T. And we should get the same answer. Because their, their method is a little bit wonky and, and really hard to explain. So I want to see if we can get their same answer using a more straightforward method. So 
P1 is 1.01 times 10 to the fifth pascals. And V1 is 15. Oh, that's why. We don't know. We don't know V1, we just know the ratio. Oh no. If the initial volume of the cylinder is 1 times 10 to the negative 3 cubic meters. Okay, good. Okay, good. R, remind me of the R value. It's one that we're going to have to use a lot when we do our homework. Uh, 8.31. Thank you. And then T1 was 300 Kelvin. Okay, they gave us CV. 20.8 and delta T we calculated is 586. All right, let's make sure that this method gets us the right answer. Ninety-three. Close. So there's is negative. Is our oh T? Where is that negative coming from? T two is bigger than T one. Okay, that's interesting. So this, this answer, or our method here, gave us the absolute value of work. Yeah, so why is that? Because it says that T2 is 886, right? And it starts out at 300 Kelvin. The initial temperature is 300 Kelvin. Did they just screw up? How would their temperature change be negative? Oh, they they use T one minus T two instead of T two minus T one. That is weird. Definitely. Oh, that's why our equation is negative. Work is negative in CV delta T. Yeah. yeah, that's why. Oh, good. Everything makes sense again. Isn't that still weird that they did T1 minus T2 instead of putting the negative out in the front? Oh, it is. Yeah. The book is often confusing. I like, I like answers that make sense, and the fact that we forgot the negative out front of the equation makes a lot more sense yeah, okay. than saying T1 minus T2. Changing rules. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Changing rules. I like when the rules are always consistent. So, all right, so we get 493.8, negative 493.8 uh, joules. All right. I like this, this method. Um, and, and just to refresh on the method here, we didn't know N, so we rearranged the ideal gas law and plugged in that for N. That's another really good tool to put into your toolbox. Pretty much, if you've got variables that you don't know, 
find one of the many other equations that we have and see if you can substitute something else in. All right, so any questions on this problem? It's nice when we actually get a solution that, solution to one of those weird things that the book has. Um, all right. The only other problem we had to look at was 19.48, and we are running really low on time. 19.48. So this is like a whole cycle thing, and it looks like they're having you go through the rigmarole of solving for the work, the Q, and the delta U for every single step. Um, so for the sake of brevity, I'm going to skip doing that problem on the board. Anybody look at that and say, holy crap, you got to do that on the board? We can do it Monday in office hours. That's, that's a good, good idea. All right, so moving right along. Actually, holy crap. <laughs> Let me see. We need to make this brief, brief, brief. Um, so the things that are left in the lecture is engines and refrigerators. And it's looking like for time we might need to just stop here. So I will take a vote um, from you guys. So are we going to have engines? And well, no, they won't be on the test because I'm not covering it. That wouldn't be fair. Just checking. No, that would not be fair. Um, but those are topics that come up with a, come up in other classes. And so um, in particular, entropy is probably never going to be explained as well as it's explained in here. I don't know that I'd do a stellar job of explaining it anyway. But I feel like, you know, that's, that's kind of something that you're only ever going to see in a physics class. Um, I'm just going to do engines really quick. We'll skip refrigerators. All right, we're going we're gonna to just talk qualitatively about this irreversible process. Um, so there's this special case of adiabatic um, processes where it's irreversible. And so that's free expansion. Um, basically, if you've got a gas in one, this double chamber, and you open the valve, it's going to go into the other chamber. Short of opening the chamber, you're not going to be able to make it go back. And it's not going to spontaneously go back. So that's what makes it irreversible. Um, okay, so there's a lot of examples of one way processes or irreversible processes. Um, so the laws of conservation of energy are not violated if any of these processes did spontaneously reverse themselves. In fact, the law of conservation of energy says that all the gas in this room could decide to move to one half of the room and not the other. We know the likelihood of that happening is almost none. So there's got to be something that says these things just won't happen. Conservation of energy is not what controls one-way processes that says things are never going to spontaneously unbreak or this cork is never going to, um, all this, you know, um, champagne is never going to spontaneously put itself back in the bottle. So what law says that that's true? Entropy. And there's many ways to define entropy and all of them lead to a lot of confusion. So um, one way is to say this is a measure of how much thermal energy is in a system that can't be converted to work. Um, one way is to say this is um, the amount of disorder in a system. Um, we often talk about entropy in general as like this gradual decline of the universe into chaos. Um, and, and there's other things you can click on these links if you want. They're all links to things in, online just for shits and giggles. Um, the symbol for entropy is S capital S. It's got units of joules per Kelvin. What we're interested in is the change, of ener change in entropy. Um, so that's just the, a little bit of heat um, over temperature. Um, and this, the change in entropy determines the direction of one-way processes. Okay, so 
basically in general entropy the change in entropy is either going to be zero or greater than zero so so everything is is gaining chaos or gaining disorder you never um, you never have your kids messy room spontaneously clean itself right <laughs> unless you go in and 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 um, put the smack down so the the entropy is something that says um, basically that dictates these one-way processes have to go in one direction. Yeah, Jacob? One of the things that I heard was when uh, I went to a uh, space convention, uh, which you ought to do, uh, <laughs> and the best way that I heard entropy explained was uh, sandcastles. Uh, you don't see sandcastles spontaneously form in sand dunes, but yet you build a sandcastle and it slowly turns back into a sand dune. There you go. That's that's a nice way of looking at it. I thought that was pretty clean, but yeah, and that and that's that's true. I mean, that's that shows like entropy is always going to work to break things down, and so never never the reverse. So that's pretty much all you need to know in order to basically this the delta delta s is greater than or equal to zero, um, and this this concept is basically the sum of everything contained in the second law of thermodynamics. So uh, entropy never decreases um, since a system is always moving towards thermal equilibrium. When, when you're in thermal equilibrium, that's where you have the maximum entropy possible in your system. Um, reversible adiabatic expansion, so that's the one we've already talked about. That's the only case where your change in entropy is zero. So every other one, um, every other process we've looked at a change in entropy would be greater than zero. So um, anyway, that's just that's that's my spiel on entropy. Um, since I'm supposed to teach you about entropy, <laughs> all right? As a physicist, you're not going to hear that in any other class. Um, so, there, are there any questions about entropy before we move on? No, I'm just qualitatively telling you about it because, like I said, this is the only time you're going to hear about it. Um, and the term gets throw thrown around colloquially and a lot of people misuse it, so I just want to make sure that you've heard it from a real physicist. Um, yeah, so we're going to skip engines, um, heat engines. You're going to see this in other classes if you need it, so I don't necessarily need to teach you heat engines. Refrigerators are, are a lot like um, heat engines. There's some really cool um, visualizations. Where's the link that, to that? If you click, click on this link here, all these thermodynamic processes we've talked about today are engines. And this article has some really cool um, diagrams showing some of these engines. Um, and it'll tell you whether like those diagrams we've seen right already where there's three points that we're connecting the dots through, that would be called a three-stroke engine. And so if you saw a two-stroke engine, then it would be going from one point back to the original starting point. A four-stroke engine would be, um, going back to our presentation here, so the, the most common compact car engine uses the Odo cycle. I know Toyotas use the Odo cycle. Um, this is a diesel cycle. So they're both four stroke engines. And so you can get that um, if, you, if you read in detail what's happening here, how each of the four thermodynamic processes happen inside the piston, that's where the physics is happening in your engine. It's in the piston. Um, so we won't do any problems on this, but it is really cool. And so I'm just kind of letting you know there's some neat stuff in this presentation even though we don't get to cover it. <laughs> After the midterm, that's fine. All right, so um, let's, let's skip here. Um, all right, so what do you guys want to do before, um, do you want to finish your lab up and then review, or do you want to review and then finish your lab? Review then lab. Um, let's take a break first.